Hey friends, it's Cammie. Nope, wrong introduction. Welcome to The Game Lair. I am your host Carmilla, but you can call me Cammie. I've been wanting to get into tabletop crafting for a while now. I finally bought some supplies for it. I've been hoarding garbage for months now. I think my wife is starting to get a little concerned. I've got single corrugated cardboard. I've got double corrugated cardboard. I've got food grade cardstock. I've got a bunch of paper towel and toilet paper tubes that I'm not sure what I'm going to do with. Maybe put them in my habitat so that I have something to chew on and crawl through and I don't get bored. Don't steal my supplies again, dude. Those aren't for you. Don't leave it. You now I have no skill and less patience, so we'll see how this goes. By the end of this series, we will have an entire um, tabletop uh, tabletop project done. Uh, that's going to be tiles and scatter and so on and so forth. We'll get into that later. Today we're going over the basics, the different tools, some terminology. You understand what we're doing. Uh, I'm not going to bother to go over safety procedures and safety precautions. We are going to be cutting and gluing things, so I'm going to assume that you know how to work with things that are sharp and hot, like your mom. If you're not familiar with my stuff, uh, I say stupid shit. I'm sure I'm going to get a lot of this wrong. I'm coming from a passing understanding of uh, construction with a lot of this. So if I get it wrong, whatever, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. That's a common refrain. Also, you will hear from me is it doesn't matter because none of this matters. Uh, but I think I think the only people who take this sort of thing seriously are like the old train guys and the old train guys aren't going to be watching this uh, these videos anyway so it doesn't really matter. The cat's playing in the background hopefully it's not too loud um, but I don't think this is the kind of hobby that you can take seriously. I mean I'm an adult literally playing with garbage uh, so let's talk terminology. All right I did a really terrible job explaining things the other day so we're back at it. Let's first talk materials. A lot of people on YouTube, when they're talking about dungeon crafting, will use foam mediums, which would be like an insulation foam or a foam core. And I feel like this process would be a little bit easier if we were to use those particular mediums, but we're just using cardboard because I didn't want to have to go buy stuff that I didn't already have. Cardboard is a paper product, comes in a few different styles. Primarily, we're going to be using corrugated cardboard. Come on, focus. Um, the corrugation is that little wiggly bit in the middle. And the point behind corrugation is that um, in packaging, if something hits the outside of the box, then the corrugation will collapse before the damage goes through to whatever the um, product inside is. Single corrugated cardboard is cardboard with a single layer of cor corrugation. Double corrugated, two layers. Pretty straightforward. If you don't have single corrugated cardboard, because it is a little bit harder to come by, you can take two pieces of single corrugated and glue them together, like so. Uh, if you're going to go this route, it is going to use up a lot more glue, because you're gluing every piece of cardboard together, but it gives you the benefit of, you take, if you line up the corrugation and then turn it once, then you'll have both, you'll have corrugation showing on both sides uh, and the reason that's helpful is when you're gluing along edges the it gives more surface space because the glue goes into the corrugation there's more stuff for the glue to hold on to we're also going to be using single not single corrugated this is a food grade card stock uh, there would be like cereal box type material we're also going to be using paper bags which this is just a um, grocery bag Construction. We're going to be doing what's called scratch building, which is just taking all the materials and putting it together in your own design, which is different than uh, kit construction, which is when you get all the pieces sent to you and then you just assemble it. Uh, most model cars are model kits. Drafting is when you figure out what you want to do and then you draw out a plan for it. Like a blueprint is a kind of drafting. So this particular draft or this plan will... <clears throat> excuse me, will have like measurements and all that so you know what pieces to cut out and what pieces you're going to need. And from that you can create a mock-up, which a mock-up is basically just kind of a slapdash version of whatever it is that you're going to make. 
like this. It's just a little slapdash thing that I put together uh, to demonstrate a thing. For paint, we're going to be using exclusively acrylic paints, which an acrylic paint is made up of three different things. An acrylic polymer, which is like a plastic rubber, water is the primary uh, medium, and pigments. Pigments are tiny little flecks of color that give the paint its color. Acrylic paint comes in a couple major forms, or a couple, whatever. Uh, this is a hobby paint, and this is a craft paint. Hobby paints are way more expensive than craft paints. For scenery, do not use expensive paints. There is no point in it. The only real difference aside from price with craft paint between, before hobby paint is the pigments in craft paint are way bigger than they are in hobby paint. So if you're painting something that has a lot of detail, quite often the pigments are larger than the detail itself. So it'll make the, um, sort of obscure the details. So it'll make the model seem really kind of gummy and will likely ruin it. When the paint dries and the water dries out of it, that acrylic hardens and it makes an acrylic paint finish really, really tough. And also, since it's uh, like a plastic or whatever, it's not then, once it dries out, it's not then water soluble, so you can paint over it without having any bleeding through like you would with other kinds of paint. You can also, before it dries, you can mix it with water and create washes, which this is just mostly water with a little bit of black paint until it got to the color I wanted. For washes, I also like to add washes or flow improvers. I like to add a drop or two of dish soap because that helps break the surface tension of the water and it makes the wash flow a little bit better. Washes will flow down into the crevices of whatever you're painting and leave the higher surfaces clear of color, generally. And it just makes the details on whatever you're painting pop a little bit more uh, and adds a bit of a shadow effect. I don't know that we're going to be using wa uh, any washes, but I decided to make some uh, terrain wash anyway. Another benefit of it being water-based is acrylic paints mix really easily with each other to create a bunch of new colors. If you need to lighten something, add a little bit of white, you need to darken it, add a little black, that sort of thing. Painting. This is a palette. It's the thing that you put your paint in. This is my second time recording, so ignore the piece that I just did. Uh, this is the palette. It's the thing that you stick your paint in. Uh, you don't necessarily need to use an actual palette like this. Uh, you're just as, you can just as well use something like a paper plate or a piece of cardboard. Brushes are pretty self-explanatory. I have, I got a big pack that had both wider bristles and tight bristles. This is for more area coverage. This is for more detail work. Base coat slash primer is when you cover your piece with um, a special kind of paint. I use a black spray paint for this. Uh, this piece was primed and then I did some example uh, painting, but I wasn't recording, so I'm doing it again. Uh, but I'm going to show you on a different piece of cardboard. Anyway, the point for the primer is just to... Um, basically gives something to, for the paint to stick to because if you don't prime your pieces a lot of the time the paint and the wash and everything will just flow right off. Let's pretend that this has been primed. Uh, so first thing we're going to do is an overbrush which I've never done an overbrush before so we'll see how it works. Basically what you want to do is you want to get about 90% coverage. You still want some of your primer uh, or your base coat to show through. So that's why I kind of pretend that this has um, black paint on it. All right, let's give this a go. Get some of the paint off. So something like this where you can still see the undercoat through it. Yep, something like that. Maybe a bit more thorough, a little less slapdash, but uh, pretty sure that's what an overbrush is supposed to look like. In order to dry brush, uh, we went with a dark gray. Uh, the dark gray doesn't show up on camera real well. It's a little too close to the black that I was using, uh, but we're using light gray for the next couple of effects. I got way too much paint. So dry brushing is when you put a little bit of paint on the brush and then you take most of it off. 
and then you drag with gentle pressure and it will hit the highlights of what you're what you're working on. I use a paper towel for taking the paint off. See how it's just hitting the top of the corrugation. Uh, if you hit just just the edge of something, ah, it's not really working. Let me do it over here. Yeah. So if you hit just the edge of something, um, it will just hit the corner for like a kind of edge highlight. So that's kind of a dry brush, kind of an, uh, sorry, overbrushing, dry brushing, and a bit of an edge highlight. For cutting, most of what we're going to be doing is working at right angles. And a right angle is when one side is perfectly perpendicular to the other side. When we talk about mitering a corner, we're taking that corner and we're cutting at a harsh edge like that. When we're talking about beveling a corner, we're talking about kind of rounding it out, though this one is pretty sloppy. For a cutting surface, I have a cutting mat. Uh, it's important to have something between what you're cutting and your table or desk or whatever. Even if it's like a work table, and it doesn't matter what you're cutting, even if it's like a work table uh, that like has a lot of gashes and cuts, what, if you're, what you're cutting is through the material and onto whatever the surface is, then you're going to destroy your blades. And this is true of anything. It's true of uh, a little hobby knife or a uh, circular saw. So you don't necessarily need to use a cutting mat like this. I don't even know why I originally bought this, but I've had it for ages uh, and it wasn't very expensive. So these are probably the best option. This is a self-healing mat. I've also seen people just lay down a piece of cardboard. The only thing I can think of that might be a problem with cardboard is it gets gouged up pretty quick so you'll end up going through a lot of it depending on how much cutting you're doing. I would assume that it's also you'll ha also have to be careful when cutting because you'll cut through onto whatever your surface is. For glue we're going to be working with two primary kinds of glue. PVA glue which is like a white glue like a paper glue. Uh, wood glue is also a PVA. Avoid uh, I think it's called school glue. It's a lot more watered down than other PVAs uh, so you're going to want to stick with a more expensive, more higher end wood glue. We're also going to be using hot glue, which is the little gun and the glue sticks. I think that's really all we need to know about terminology. Hopefully we're all on the same page with stuff. Um, we're going to talk supplies next so that you know what you need to kind of get into this particular hobby.